Hi everyone, um, welcome to lecture guide number two, the second content-based lecture for the course. Uh, in today's lecture, um, we're going to be looking at early photography, photography basically from the 1830s or so up near the end of the century, but we're going to be focusing on, in particular, the technological evolution, the differing looks and usages of various types of photography, as well as some of the emergent critical positions on uh, what photography should be, what it should be used for, how you should do it, and so forth. Um, it's, like the last lecture, technologically driven. This isn't, honestly, my favorite component of the course, uh, but it does give you a, a pretty good sense of the correlation between the technology itself and why it might be thought of in a particular way or per, put to a particular use. And then in the second lecture for this week, we'll go on to more complex questions about how photography began to be considered an art form. So with that in mind, make sure that you've printed out lecture guide number two to follow along with today's lecture. Um, not every single image that you'll be seeing in this PowerPoint is a part of the lecture guide. I only put in, I'll remind you, the most important images in those lecture guides. You can also, of course, in each one of the modules, um, go get the PDF file of the PowerPoints if you want to look those over in more detail or spend more time with them or print them out and put notes in them or what have you. So I start off here with an image that, that just tries to capture, it's a, a kind of caricature of, uh, you know, everyone going crazy for photography, in particular, uh, the, de the daguerreotype itself, which is where we'll start today's lecture. Um, and it's called daguerreotype mania, of course. So, um, you know, everyone is interested in this new form of technology. Everyone's kind of thinking about um, what different usages you can put this to and, and so forth. So let's start there. Um, you know, remember these things all start with these major originators. Henry Fox Talbot, of course, coming up with a calbotype or sometimes called the Talbotype, which is uh, very different than the daguerreotype in that it's a positive negative process of printing rather than just uh, that one off that you get from the daguerreotype. And the other originator or one of the originators, Louis Daguerre, which we went over last week. So the daguerreotype, um, although it was invented a little bit earlier than this, of course, its main time of popularity was from 1839 or so through the mid 1950s. Um, and and let's, let's kind of work our way through that story and you know what's so interesting about the daguerreotype itself. Um, the daguerreotype, because the only place it was patented was in England, uh, catches fire uh, everywhere else you know in the world that it's put to use in France and Scotland, Ireland, um, and in particular in the United States where we'll be spending the majority uh, of today's lecture on the daguerreotype. Um, it's again to remind you the daguerreotype has um, some really interesting qualities to it that make it you know the preferred at this time uh, form of photography when it comes to portraits. Um, its strengths, right? It's very high resolution. You get a really, really sharp image when you use a daguerreotype, uh, particularly compared with the the, cal, uh, the calotype process, which is, you know, kind of grainy. It reproduces all the imperfections in the paper that is its negative and, and really doesn't give you that crisp quality. Um, so it's perfect for portraits, right? If the main reason for a portrait is to get a very accurate likeness of a person, the daguerreotype's the place that you're going to go originally until the calotype or that process of positive negative printing uh, gets a little bit more perfective. There's also, of course, um, the rising middle class during the 19th century, more and more people who are looking for portraits um, in the past, before this time, you had to be fairly wealthy to afford an oil painting portrait of yourself. And so here's this new technology that makes getting a portrait of yourself relatively inexpensive. And of course, 
this leads to uh, the popularity of the daguerreotype. By the 19, uh, 1850s, the daguerreotype is something that is being reproduced in America somewhere in the neighborhood of 3 million daguerreotypes in a year. That's kind of astounding. It had, does have some, some shortfalls though, right? One of the shortfalls is that it is a very, very fragile surface so that when you print on this metal, any scratch on the surface of it, you know, which is really easy to do, is going to cause an imperfection in that likeness, which then, of course, you know, necessitated these very fancy thermoplastic cases, um, you know, glass protective sheets over the top of those and so forth. Number two, um, the daguerreotype produces a mirror image of whatever you pointed at. It doesn't have the ability to reverse that mirror, so it really, uh, it basically substitutes right for left in the way that we would think of a contemporary photograph. Now, um, various daguerreotypists uh, will try to fix this by actually creating a photograph not of a person, but of their reflection in a mirror so as to reverse the process back. The big one, though, is that a daguerreotype is a one-off. It's not a positive-negative process, so the daguerreotype itself is something that you only get one of. There's only one of it per exposure. Uh, you can't reprint this over and over again like you can other forms of the photographic processes of the time. Um, and so that's uh, obviously a problem as well. Um, now, the other problems that it has, long exposure times and so forth, those are problems that all photography had at this time. When the daguerreotype first comes into existence, of course, it's a really, really simple camera that we went over last week. You just open the lens cap, allow the light um, to reflect off whatever object you're trying to photograph onto the photographic medium inside. Again, the exposure times uh, in the 18, late 1830s through the 40s is very long. Uh, it slowly but surely gets shorter and shorter in time, but it's still one of those um, you know, photographic mechanisms and technologies that necessitates a stable object that you're taking a photograph of. It can't have any movement at all in it. The original um, explosion of the daguerreotype in the United States happened almost immediately after um, the introduction, introduction of the technology. I show you here a picture which is a, an actual daguerreotype uh, photograph of Samuel Morse. This is the man who created Morse code. He was initially a painter, and um, he was m one of many American painters who went to Europe, trained in painting to perfect his craft, brought back his interest in the styles of Europe at the time, were, which were very classically based to the United States, and tried to um, make a career out of being a painter. Um, but at this time, again, early 19th century, Americans weren't all that interested in uh, European-style paintings produced by Americans. There wasn't a big market for it. A lot of people saw the styles in Europe as being very elitist, uh, too tied to European traditions. And so many painters had a really tough time uh, doing anything more than just portraiture. And then, of course, your clientele is pretty limited to those who can afford a portrait. On the right-hand side of this screen, you see um, his famous picture that was in the Seattle Art Museum just a couple of years ago called the Gallery of the Louvre. Um, this was his painting of a famous gallery, the Grand Gallery of the Louvre. You can see the Mona Lisa down at the bottom on the right-hand side of the, the painting. And his idea here was that he would paint um, this this painting of all of these other paintings in the Louvre to get the American public interested in European style paintings because after all most of them couldn't travel to Europe they didn't have money for it uh, and and then he hoped uh, after seeing pictures of other pictures like this people would get interested in that style and maybe you would have a career as a painter it didn't work and this is a good thing in a couple of different ways he went on to develop Morse code but he also um, 
was in correspondence with Louis Daguerre and was one of the first people to reproduce the manual of the daguerreotype in the United States and really pushed the use of the daguerreotype in the United States. In its first explosion in the United States, the people who are daguerreotypists, right, they're operators of a daguerreotype, uh, are all over the place. They're basically amateurs. Uh, in the 1830s in the United States, that's when we suffered our first depression. Uh, and so people were looking for jobs in all types of new uh, technologies. And portraiture and using the daguerreotype process was something that a lot of people went into, which is why you often see this, this famous quote uh, of Nathaniel Hawthorne's um, from Nathaniel Hawthorne's The House of the Seven Gables, uh, where one of the main characters is a daguerreotypist uh, who has gone through a whole series of other jobs, right? Holgrave was at one point a schoolmaster, a salesman, a political editor, a peddler of cologne water, a dentist, um, a packet, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a public lecturer on mesmerism and so forth. And he was also a daguerreotypist. Everyone was trying to do it. And as Nathaniel Hawthorne, quote, says, um, quote, his present in, in his present phase as a daguerreotypist was no more important in his own view and not likely to be more uh, permanent than any of his preceding ones. It had been taken up with the careless alacrity of an adventurer who had his bread to earn, it would be thrown aside as carelessly whenever he should choose to earn bread by some other equally digressive means. The point there is just everyone was doing it and they didn't have a ton of technological expertise. It's part of what people oftentimes refer to as the frontier mentality in the United States where people were just trying to be entrepreneurs or pick up on the latest technological crazes and make some money uh, off of that. Because there were no patents, anyone could do it. And it didn't take a lot of um, investment to get a uh, you know, daguerreotype camera and go to work. However, with that having been said, there were, a uh, starting in the 1840s, um, some really prominent and much more elaborate uh, daguerreotype studios. The first big one was founded by Alexander Walcott and John uh, Johnson, uh, who, along with the help of Henry uh, Fitz, who was a lens maker, developed a camera that used a concave mirror in order to get a little bit crisper uh, use of light in the camera. And you see this really simple camera here on the screen for you. You also see a diagram of all the mirrors and various uh, implements that were used to filter light into the photographic studio. They would have elaborate open skylights passing through and bouncing off various mirrors into the studio uh, through a kind of palette that was oftentimes filled with uh, bottles of color, colored bottles of water so as to soften the light and create a more pleasing photograph. And let's say you had a little bit more money, uh, you would want to go to one of these studios, uh, this one being uh, the first of those. So remember this, this is Henry Fitz, uh, his self-portrait from 1939. Now the, the daguerreotype has been heavily damaged, but it's one of those first of the daguerreotype portraits uh, by this very prominent studio. And, you know, they start to develop from there. Another big photographic studio in the United States uh, was started by John Plum Jr. Um, John Plum Jr. Uh, uh, started what was called, he called it, the U.S. Photographic Institute in Boston in 1841. He not only, uh, you know, charged for you to have a very nice daguerreotype produced of you, uh, he also sold various uh, photographic apparatuses, cameras, materials, gave you instruction, created classes, and so forth. He um, colored his daguerreotypes using an electroplating uh, process that, um, you know, is still used today to color uh, metals and, and got pretty good at that. And he also started the first wave of celebrity photos um, which was a big thing. Um, various daguerreotype studios would oftentimes get big celebrities of the day to come sit for them uh, and then publish 
you know, make available through a printing process known as aquatints these photographs of celebrities so that other people would want to go have their photographs taken at the same studio as various celebrities of the day. So, you know, here you see this, this man reading a newspaper. It's a simple daguerreotype. What you will notice over and again in the daguerreotypes in these early photographs is how strictly posed everyone was. Remember that the, the exposure time at this point is somewhere around a minute uh, sometimes it can be a little bit shorter, but it's a long exposure time. So no one's smiling. No one is doing anything. They tend to be posed very strictly, again, with those things behind their head, holding them in place uh, so that you don't have a fuzzy image. You can actually see some of the fuzziness here on the newspaper that probably was reflecting light a little bit stronger than anything else and was maybe bending a little bit or shaking in his hand. Uh, another Photograph here from uh, another major photographic studio of the time, uh, the Southworth Hawes studio of Roland Heber Neal, the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Boston. Again, uh, I could spend more time on talking about, uh, you know, all of these uh, various studios. They are, they're much higher quality than the traveling daguerreotype or daguerreotypist or someone who's just setting up shop, uh, you know, um, in a smaller studio. They give you higher quality images. They, you know, have all of these ways to reflect light in the studio and so forth. Um, you know, he had a, a, a room built, uh, Southworth and Haas had a room built that had a giant skylight with various scrims in it to allow softer light in and so forth. So again, if you had more money, you'd go to one of these places and it showed um, just how good that technology could be uh, if it was used by someone who had a high level of expertise in using it. So here they are showing you an actual operating room at Massachusetts General Hospital with a woman patient in the middle of this and everyone has stopped and posed, of course, for this image. Anything that's in movement, you'll see multiple different reflections, for instance, on the side. Um, because of the long exposure times uh, at this uh, at this moment in the technology itself. A major player in our story is Matthew Brady. Uh, we'll barely be touching on him today, but he's going to come back quite a bit um, next week when we go into photographs uh, produced of the Civil War because Matthew Brady, who started off in one of these major studios and then started his own studio, um, got very uh, technologically uh, advanced um, pretty quickly. He was uh, also a major theorist of photography. He read, for instance, and many people at this time were interested in these types of, um, you know, scholarly um, uh, pursuits. He, he read Johann Caspar Lavater's famous essays on physiognomy. And what physiognomy is, is the belief that the external appearance of someone, uh, whether this be in terms of ethnicity or gender or just facial type, was somehow indicative of inner personality or intrinsic qualities to people. So in other words, it's the idea that if you were to study the way someone looks in all of their uh, nuances. You could tell something about who they were inside. And of course, this, this kind of thinking is something that a photographer would probably be pretty interested in, since one of the things that photography is so good at is capturing these likenesses. And as the century goes forward and all the way into the 20th century, many photographers were interested in creating compendiums of different types of people uh, based upon physiognomical um, ideas uh, here. But he got famous primarily by creating uh, portraits of celebrities. Uh, and he was pretty smart, uh, quite a marketer. He would send these photographs, again, they're all daguerreotype photos at this stage, to various um, newspaper publications as, again, prints that were created from the photographs to be reproduced for free. Uh, and then you could have all these celebrity photos showing up in newspapers with the little insignia down there below that said, uh, portrait done by Matthew Brady's studio, and then you'd want to go to Matthew Brady's studio. So this is Dolly Madsen, 
Um, uh, this is another daguerreotype by Matthew Brady of James, uh, John James Audubon, uh, yeah, the guy who created uh, Audubon's pictures of North American birds and all of those wonderful prints. And you can see, if you follow my cursor, him signing these things over to the side, right? Brady in New York, that's who did this, which would bring more clientele uh, in uh, into a studio. Later on, Matthew Brady will be famous for um, sending other photographers primarily out into the field to capture images of the Civil War, but we'll get to that next week. Um, uh, just a couple of other celebrity um, daguerreotypes, because again, it's not just people wanting portraits of themselves at this stage. They also want portraits of famous people in the world around them to have these likenesses. So this is Edgar Allan Poe. Remember what Poe said about photography, he loved it, right? This kind of magical property of photography and and his, um, you know, he loved the imagination, but unlike Baudelaire, he thought the photography could spark the imagination in ways that um, Baudelaire completely disdained. Henry David Thoreau, Frederick Douglass, Emily Dickinson, right? You would not just buy a, uh, they wouldn't just sit for these daguerreotypes and have them for themselves. People would buy them and set them up in their house. And you see this daguerreotype of two men looking at daguerreotypes of other people, not just their family, but celebrities, famous people in the world. The other thing that um, I wanted to point out, it's in the background of all of these things, is that, of course, photography documents the world around us in some way. We'll get to the question of what a document is next week. and and how that is a slippery territory, but it does um, allow us to return to history and see things that um, make evident, for instance, here in the officer and the manservant, various social relations. So for instance, painting did this as well, but it becomes so prolific in photography, you can see you know, the use of slaves or you know, former slaves now being manservants and the social relations between the haves and the have-nots, those in the majority and those in the minority. Um, oftentimes, as I said before, you'll see these portraits of uh, you know, black people, Native Americans, people of various ethnicities that came from an interest in physiognomy, trying to determine some kind of relation between the interior properties of various ethnic types and their physical properties, these pseudosciences that were oftentimes used to justify racism. If you're wondering why the portrait is done here in profile, that's because there are three other portraits of this man, Jack, from Guinea. Um, one in, uh, from the other side, one from the front, and one from the back. They're just trying to show you his uh, physiological type. And here in El Patroncito, you see the little white girl surrounded um, by people who are probably her servants. You also see these horrible moments of, in this case, what will, you know, blackface, a uh, blackface minstrel. Uh, these traveling uh, theater, uh, you know, things that were forms of popular entertainment, but racially insensitive at the very best, to say the least. And then, of course, um, on the other side of things, I should note while we're on this, that there were many um, photographers who are people of color, including Augustus Washington, who had his own studio, uh, who will focus in on the heroes, uh, their own heroes. This is John Brown, who, of course, led the revolt at Harper's Ferry. Uh, and in some ways, you know, these, these kinds of early abolitionists, John Brown being one of them, uh, will lead to the, the, you know, finally the Civil War and the emancipation of slave or slaves and, and the, you know, uh, uh, the end of slavery in the United States. So the subjects that they pick, the stars or the heroes or the celebrities in their world um, are a little bit different than the celebrities in the world of, let's say, uh, everyday white people. Just a couple of uh, fun ones here. You know, as the process keeps getting uh, a little bit quicker in terms of exposure time, um, as people, 
uh, start to play around with this more. You get people accompanied in their portraits by all of the things that signify who they are. So the man with the pipe who set himself up as a scholar here, or a woman sitting on a horseback uh, being a cultured woman. You can see here the daguerreotype process at work. The woman's sitting pretty still, and so she's in tight focus, whereas the horse is probably moving around slightly, at least its head, and you see that slightly out of focus. You see, you know, social relations. Um, this is Henry with a Winthrop Sargent and his family, so the man kind of uh, in the center of the picture. Uh, the women closest to the children and reading to the children and you think about how this in some way reflects the societal views of uh, the status of the husband versus the status of the wife the different uh, roles that they play in their world and so forth and again in combination with literally millions of other uh, daguerreotypes on this it not only reflects societal views of the time but it perpetuates those kind of gender norms I don't know what this is. I just put it in. It's it's a weird one of a man and a woman. I, I suppose that it's supposed to be a man, uh, a romantic portrait of the couple, but it's so, um, you know, over the top melodramatic. I couldn't bear not to put it in. Now, along with those big studios, of course, there were uh, studios that traveled to try to kind of corner the market and smaller cities uh, around the United States. And so you have these traveling daguerreotype studios, such as the one that you see here that would come into town for a couple of weeks, probably along with a country fair, and everyone would show up there to get their daguerreotype done. Another thing I wanted to point out here is that uh, the daguerreotype started to be used in ways that you wouldn't think of it today to commemorate, in this case, uh, people who had passed. This is a portrait of a man and a woman with a, a painting of another man who's probably a family relative who has since died, and so he couldn't be there for this, but they stuck the portrait, uh, a painting of the man in the daguerreotype to include him. You also had what were known as death portraits. Um, these were particularly popular with young children. Uh, here you see a portrait of an older man, Dr. Amuzat, um, once someone had died, let's say you hadn't had their, their last portrait done and you wanted a likeness of them to remember them by, you could actually have a daguerreotypist come to your home or you could bring the, the dead body to a studio and have that portrait done. As I said, um, especially young children uh, were, uh, were photographed if they died uh, in order to have some kind of you know, memory of them. And then you have fun things, devil exposures uh, or, um, you know, uh, composite prints even in their own way. A uh, photograph of a man next to a, you know, with two heads here. And a little bit of electroplating. You could actually color photographs through various processes. These again are still daguerreotypes. So in this case, electroplating was the preferred meth uh, method. You would paint on various um, uh, metallic minerals onto the daguerreotype and submit it to uh, a small dose of electrical voltage that basically adheres those colors onto the daguerreotype surface itself. It's a long process uh, and various of the high-end studios got better and better at these including uh, John Plum's studio. And then of course, although it was illegal at the time, of uh, eroticism and erotic pictures began to be a major component of the daguerreotype, which of course are still around today. If you've done, you know, your Google searching, you can't get away from uh, erotic pictures. Um, again, these were illegal at the time, but there was this underground black market for erotic imagery um, of the daguerreotype. And then, you know, I just wanted to put this in. This is John Whipple's um, uh, daguerreotype of the moon. John Whipple actually was someone who worked in, uh, you know, in, in creating telescopic lenses. And it didn't take much to figure out how to attach a telescopic lens to a daguerreotype camera and take a pretty interesting photo of the moon here. So that you could, you know, he could produce many of these and people would go buy these close-ups of the moon that otherwise you could only see fleetingly in a telescope. 
Excuse me here while I pause for a moment. I'll be right back. Jeez. Okay, sorry for that. But I will have to pause every once in a while to get a drink of water or something of that sort. So let's move on to the calotype, just kind of the development of this process as well. Now, just like the daguerreotype, it has its moment in the sun. Um, one of the reasons, as I said last week, that the calotype or the type, as it was often called as well, based upon the originator of this process, one of the reasons this didn't really catch on quite as much as the daguerreotype is that Henry Talbot, um, you know, got a patent on this process, so you had to pay for it um, right up through the 1840s, where another process was developed, the collodion, and and that um, that basically was a better type of technology, and of course, no one wanted to pay for the calotype in the first place anyway, and so people gravitated towards this this other process later on. Now, the calotype process has some qualities that are make it, um, you know, preferable to uh, to the daguerreotype for various usages. In that it is a positive negative process or a negative positive process. You create a photographic negative that then can be reprinted over and over and over again uh, to create multiples. The downside of it was that it wasn't, it didn't have the same type of resolution as we would say today. As a daguerreotype, it showed lots of imperfections uh, in the pa uh, paper that was used for the negatives. Uh, and, and so, you know, uh, that was something that made many people who wanted a portrait done, for instance, prefer the daguerreotype. It also had its early major practitioners, just like the daguerreotype. Um, two of the, the earliest of these are David Octavius Hill and Robert Addison, Adamson, sorry, who started um, a, a, a photographic studio, the Hill Adamson Studio, uh, in which they produced more kind of artsy types of uh, photographs, either of buildings or later portraits of very prominent people uh, in England um, in Scotland. The reason that um, D.O. Hill and Adamson were able to start a photographic studio using the uh, calotype process is that for whatever reason the patent didn't extend to Scotland and so they were Scottish and they set up their studio in Scotland and avoided all the the payments that they would have to make to to uh, Henry Talbot. I just showed you this, I uh, wanted to show you this image to show you again the the negative positive process. On the left hand side you have the photographic negative. Um, this was again a negative that was originally created by uh, basically silvering a, uh, a piece of paper and I went into the greater detail about that process last week uh, that then could be reprinted by being re-exposed and usually you just sandwich this on top of another piece of photographically sensitized paper to reverse the image into a positive image. And then, of course, you can reprint this kind of endlessly uh, without any de deterioration as long as you don't um, damage the photographic negative. But as you can see here, the photographic fidelity isn't quite the same. It doesn't have the same sharpness. It has a lot of kind of um, atmospheric effect, um, meaning that it looks grainy and you get this, this kind of feeling of different subtle tonalities that that you don't get in the daguerreotype. And that's something important because that look, that kind of grainy, atmospheric, slight tonal variation, the imperfections of the paper negative showing up, uh, lend itself to artistic uh, portraits. And what I mean by that is that, remember, that at this time, um, an accurate likeness of someone, a perfect kind of very high fidelity portrait of someone didn't look like the art of the time that was filled with allegory and mood and, you know, tonalities and things that were meant to give you a sense of the emotional qualities of the, the sitter. And, and so 
when you started to see the calotype process, here you have a, a portrait done by the Hill uh, Adamson uh, studio of a man. When you see these calotypes being used, you can see the difference you know, in the look between this and a daguerreotype. They're hazy. Um, they, they, you know, they look, um, they look for the period of the time more artistic in the sense that, you know, you get all these tonal variations and subtle, um, qualities to the lights and darks that feel moody and they look like the types of paintings of the time that were being produced. And I'll go into this more in the second lecture for this week when we start talking about, uh, art photography, um, uh, more properly. But in any case, um, you know, uh, right around the same time period, um, you know, there were a number of essays written in order to support the idea that uh, photography could be an art or more like an art. Almost no one at this time really argued very strongly that photographs in themselves were just as artistic as paintings and sculptures. They kind of said, they got right up to the verge of it. They would say things like, well, it could be a support for the arts or it could be a kind of second quality art, not quite art. Um, but these essays start to be produced and one of the earliest in 1853, written by Sir William Newton, um, where he spoke to the Photographic Society of London uh, in, in an essay that later got titled Photography in an Artistic View, he said that pictures should quote, not be so chemically as artistically beautiful. I do not conceive it to be necessary that the whole subject should be what is called in focus. On the contrary, I found that the object is better obtained by the whole subject being a little out of focus, thereby giving a greater breadth of effect and consequently more suggestive of the true character of nature. Now what he's getting at here, for those of you who are kind of paying attention to the reading is has to do with the art part of photography. As I said before, the likeness, the fidelity to nature was something that everyone expected from photography up to a particular point. But if you could only think of a photograph as a slavish mechanical reproduction of the world, then where is the art part of that? It's just a reproduction of the world out there. So the idea of effect, you know, some kind of quality of the true nature of the world or of the sitter, which could be, let's say, manifest in things like, in this case, something that's a little out of focus, a little hazy, uh, something that gives you a sense of the, perhaps the nuance of the sitter or something of the, the emotional kind of interior state of a, a person. That was the artistic part it was conceived of photography. They wanted to, again, add in the idea of an artist, you know, the idea of a photographer making decisions, trying to evoke more than just the accurate likeness of something every time they argued that photography was like an art. So a, for instance, are these portraits um, again, by uh, Hill and Adamson of Lady Elizabeth Eastlake. Now, Lady Elizabeth Eastlake's husband uh, was actually a, a major player in the art world. Um, uh, Sir Eastlake was the, um, the director of the National Gallery at the time. He wrote essays, as did Lady Eastlake here, on the artistic qualities of photography. Um, and help support photography as an art. So here you have a portrait of Lady Eastlake that again is all about her interior state, right? She's sitting there thinking, lost in, uh, you know, her thought. And while it's not as, let's say, um, high fidelity as the daguerreotype, the haziness of this, the kind of moody quality of the atmospheric effects, the areas that are a little out of focus were all taken to be artistic. Here's another such image you see her here, again, lost in thought, striking a pose that is less about capturing what she looks like than some idea of her emotional state or about feeling with, of course, a sculpture in the background to 
um, to equate photography with various forms of established arts. And here's another of these, these you know, women in high society doesn't even show you her from the front. It seems to be a picture that's all about the beautiful textures and the lights and darks and the grainy quality actually helps to enhance this. Uh, the calotype process, in other words, enhances what was considered to be artistic rather than just a mechanical reproduction of the world in front of you. Now, excuse me. I'm going to pause again. Now, if we start to look at this in terms of other types of photographs, photographs that aren't necessarily portraits of people, you can see the and, and pay more attention to the technological development of the calotype process. Um, you can see some of the other usages of early photography. Um, one of the major uh, innovators of photography was a man by the name of Louis Desiree Blackard Evrard, who created a process uh, known as the albumin uh, silver print process. Um, now, albumin is basically egg white uh, and salt that is applied to paper so as to create a more sensitive and more durable negative uh, that then could be used to shorten the exposure time um, and also create, when you used albumin on the photographic print itself, a more durable uh, photograph, um, something that wasn't just paper itself, it actually has a coating of egg white, so it's a little stiffer, like, let's say, more contemporary printed photography. This process then got picked up by a number of artistically inclined photographers, including Thomas Sutton here, who uh, created this picture called a Souvenir de Jer Jersey, uh, which is a, it was an entire series of pictures of this area of the world um, in, in kind of very artistically inclined practices. Um, and what I mean by that is you've got this beautiful kind of castle on the harbor and these old beautiful ships and the artist has set up the, the, the camera right in the middle of these so as to create a typically classical type of composition with a clear focus in the center that a castle, the, the slightly inclining mass of the ships pointing our attention to that. Um, and again, it's not about, in this case, capturing what this looks like so much as creating something that almost looks like a print would of this architectural edifice here. Um, and, and so again, you know, what we're doing is we're thinking about how photography now gets used in an artistic way. This is another portrait um, of the uh, Souvenir de Jersey. Um, thinking about the artistic qualities of this now rather than something that's just meant to document how something looks. Uh, it's the harbor now shot from a different point of view. Uh, that grainy quality, the out of focus quality of the photograph was something that was meant to evoke an effect. More about what this place feels like. It's a very old town, so thinking about kind of nostalgia about old uh, practices of, uh, you know, very rural societies or societies that are rapidly disappearing amidst the Industrial Revolution uh, and very in, uh, artistically inclined here. Another major innovator at this time uh, was this man, uh, Gustave Le Gray. Uh, Gustave Le Gray uh, was someone who who, again, most of these practitioners of photography would mess around a little bit with the technology. And he basically uh, waxed the paper negative before sensitizing it. He basically, with a very thin layer of wax uh, over it, uh, create, could create a very sensitized negative uh, so that exposure times went down quite a bit for him. He could get an exposure in, you know, a second or two. And that allowed different things to be photographed. In this case, for instance, we wouldn't think of it today much, but the 
the ability to actually capture the water and the rippling of the waves without them blurring away was something that could only occur if you had this highly sensitized negative that was created by a process of waxing the paper itself. Um, and so, in a way, hand in hand with the advancement of technology, you know, the ability to, to capture photographs of, in this case, water that's constantly in movement, uh, became uh, available to people. And you could basically market yourself uh, based upon the technology that you developed because no one else could get this very accurate representation of water, for instance. However, with that being said, if you look really carefully at this and you go right along the horizon line, you see how sharp and kind of straight that horizon is, except right around here where you've got these little dots of boats kind of going over the horizon. The reason for this is that um, these photographs of nature where you have a lot of sky and you've got uh, a lot of landscape really didn't work unless you created composite negatives. Now composite negative, as you will have got from your reading, is creating a photograph, in this case of the water, and then cutting that photograph off or that negative off right along the horizon line at a very sharp line, and then creating another photograph of the sun itself and splicing these together. And the reason that you had to do that is that if you were to take this photograph of the sky and the water together, they need different exposure times. In other words, the, the sky is too light. And if you expose the negative for the amount of time that you need for a, a sky scene, which is very, very short, you won't get any of the detail of the landscape that you want. And, and inversely, if you took a photograph that used the proper exposure time for the landscape, um, you would get an overexposure of the sky so everything would be really, really washed out in the sky. So just about every photograph of the natural world before the use of the collodion process, the wet place process that we'll talk about later, is a composite print. Um, the sky shot separately from the water. And oftentimes these photographers would have, and you can see this if you look at these photographs, two or three favorite shots of the sky that they would use over and over again uh, in combination printing with their various landscapes that they included. Uh, Gustave Le Gray also was very famous for creating these nature scenes of the Forest of Fontainebleau. Now the Forest of Fontainebleau series from the 50s, again a cal calotype process, was very popular at the time because these were mimicking uh, the very scenes that were being created by, for instance, the Barbizon school of, in particular, French painters. Uh, the Forest of Fontainebleau is about 40 miles outside of Paris. It's a kind of little artistic uh, uh, community at this time. Amidst the Industrial Revolution, people were really feeling cramped in the cities and they oftentimes wanted uh, first uh, paintings of the natural world, these beautiful places that you could escape to uh, on long weekends. Uh, and then, you know, in the comfort of your office or in your home, kind of nostalgically return to by looking first at paintings of these scenes and then later, of course, at photographs of these scenes. And, and so, um, you know, Gustave Le Gray seized upon this. What's so interesting about these to me is how much the photographer is trying to make the photograph look like the same types of paintings that were being created at this time. They're very hazy, there's little areas of kind of moderately sharp focus, but otherwise it's this, it's this uh, very kind of evocative scene of tonal variations and, uh, you know, the natural world itself. Here's another one from the Fontainebleau series. They look again like Barbizon school paintings. And then I uh, just wanted to show you a more artistically inclined uh, painter in France, Charles Negre. Uh, Charles Negre basically used Le Gray's process, waxing the paper negative, and he was very interested in creating these 
these kinds of many genre portraits, meaning everyday pictures of everyday scenes. This one's called the little rag picker. Uh, rag pickers were basically kind of um, very lower class kids going around and, uh, you know, uh, working for pennies. Um, uh, and here you see him sitting on his step, looking fairly forlorn. It's a, it's a type of photograph that you would see oftentimes in paintings of the time, the subject that is, um, you know, now being done by photographers. Or one of his most famous uh, photographs is uh, the vampire, Henri Le Sec, at Notre Dame Cathedral in 1853 where um, he's shooting the scene of a, a prominent man at the time standing on the one of the balconies of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris uh, next to a gargoyle with this beautiful, um, you know, uh, capturing of the, the architecture itself, but also with this portrait of this man in his top hat amidst all of that and the city in the background. Now, what displaces the calotype is a process known as the collodion or wet plate process, which gets developed in the 1850s. And initially, I think I made mention of this last week, uh, Henry Talbot tries to sue the originators of the collodion or wet plate process, saying that it infringed upon his uh, patent, but he loses that suit. And because the collodion process is such higher fidelity, um, than the calotype, it takes over, um, you know, very quickly. So read along with me. The collodion, which was invented in 1851 by Frederick Scott Archer, an English sculptor and photographer, basically takes a thick, syrupy liquid made by dissolving nitrated cotton uh, in a mixture of alcohol and ether, and a, a soluble iodide was added to the solution and then this viscid liquid, which was known as collodion, was poured onto the wet, uh, onto the glass plate evenly, sensit and then you'd sensitize this coated uh, glass plate in a solution of silver nitrate. It's almost always silvers that are being used to, uh, to, to create the, the photographic process, um, therefore creating a light-sensitive silver iodide, just like the daguerreotype, or very similar to it, but on a piece of glass. Now you had to use this process while the, um, while the plate was still tacky. If it had dried out completely, it, it's not very sensitive. Um, and so, um, you know, so you do all of this right before actually taking a photograph. And because um, Archer didn't patent his invention, um, this was open to everyone, and it, it made the positive or the negative positive process now much more financially um, useful. You didn't have to pay for the patent rights to Talbot, uh, and because it was so high fidelity, um, people picked on, up on it right away. So here's just a, a diagram of how this goes, right? You polish the, the plate or the piece of glass, you sensitize the plate in collodion, then you um, uh, develop the plate uh, by submitting it more sensitive materials, a hypobath or a cyanide. And, you know, of course, for those of you who don't know early technologies, all of this has to do, has to be done when you're developing the plate in semi-darkness, or at least with a the help of an ultraviolet light. And so you see some of the makeshift ways that they would create quick dark rooms. So what do you get from this? You get really high fidelity now, positive, negative prints or negative positive prints. Um, and one of the first to really make use of this in the United States was Frederick's photographic temple of art in, on Broadway in New York, where you could come either get a daguerreotype or you could get a collodion print um, if you wanted multiple uh, copies of whatever you were uh, taking a picture of. At this point, um, the exposure times go way down. So an exposure time on a collodion at this is about two seconds initially, and then it gets down to um, you know, under a second uh, within, you know, by the 1860s or so. You can print these things much faster than you could um, the calotype process. 
It's much more predictable than the calotype process. And by about 1855 or so, everyone's using it all over Europe. And, and then by the 1860s, it's all over the United States as well. So one of the early um, you know, studios in England was uh, Frith & Company. Uh, you see here their, their picture of Scarborough. And you know, again, another photographer taking pictures of ornamental sculptures in Paris so that you could you know, document these, save these, use these to, uh, people would buy these so that they could um, you know, copy the same design in their own architectural or ornamental works. You could have portraits done, as you see here, um, of uh, a man who invented the steamship uh, in front of these giant chains of a ship. You could create uh, very uh, artistically inclined photographs, just like the Talba type here, a seated Olisk, which is a harem slave, by the way, is basically Roger Fenton, who was a major practitioner of the Collodion, would copy basically painting styles, uh, which is happening here. And then some really uh, famous photographs, in this case, the Countess uh, Castiglione, who was a, a big supporter of photography and basically documented her life through photographs, these very artistic uh, photographs of celebrity figures in, in this case, in France. The other thing you can do with a collodion is you don't actually need to develop the, uh, I mean, not develop, you don't need to print the negative. You can use the negative itself in the same way that you would use a slide today. And so they became a favorite uh, for use in these magic lantern um, theater theatrical productions that we talked about last week. You could basically shine a bright light through it and project uh, photographic images on sheets and scrims and walls and so forth, right? And this became, it kind of reinvigorated the magic lantern. So now let's go fairly quickly through some other technologies that developed in the, 19, or the 1800s, the late part of the 19th century. First that I wanna just kind of make reference to is the ambrotype. The ambrotype, which literally means imperishable, uh, was patented in 1854 by James A. Cutting of Boston. The concept had been around since uh, Sir John Herschel pointed out in 1840, but basically what you do is um, you create uh, a kind of collodion type on, uh, on but on a very thin glass negative. And then, so you've basically got like a negative, right? Just like a collodion negative, but on a very thin piece of glass. But then you would paint, put that negative over a black background. And of course it would, when viewed in reflective light, appear to be a positive. So they're singles, just like daguerreotypes, uh, but they're not as easily damaged as a daguerreotype. And so, here you see it, the, on the right hand side of the screen is the, uh, uh, the amber type collodion negative, which doesn't have a backing behind it, so it looks like a negative. And on the left hand side, you see it against a black background where it has been turned into a positive. And you know, this was used for everything, including Preston Butler's famous pictures of Abraham Lincoln. By the way, um, you know, Matthew Brady created pictures of Abraham Lincoln too. And Lincoln would point out that on the right, you see a, a portrait by Brady himself. Again, Brady has signed that portrait on there. Uh, Abraham Lincoln said without these pictures, he would have never gotten elected. Kind of interesting. Then you have cheaper forms of basically the daguerreotype. Uh, a tin type is almost entirely an American development and almost only used in the United States. It's basically um, a cheaper modification of the amber type. A tin type begins with a sheet of, uh, of sheet iron that's coated with a black surface and then coated again with a sensitized collodion layer that is then exposed to light. And basically you get a very, very cheap type of photograph. So for people who couldn't afford a daguerreotype or couldn't afford a amber type, the tin type is something that you could go get for you know less than a dollar here. And, and they're not as high quality, um, you know, 
as a daguerreotype, but they are uh, a mass-produced form of photography for, again, people who couldn't afford the other types of technologies. And here are just a few of those. Notice that, again, if we were to spend more time on this, the picture of the woman has been um, electroplated with a little bit of rouge on her uh, on her cheek, uh, so as to you know pick up the use of cosmetics. She's looking at herself in a mirror, which is a really age old representation of femininity and uh, women being uh, all about beauty. It also allows you to see this beautiful hair from the front and the back while still still seeing her face. And then you see a guy, and the man wants to have himself pictured in his uh, in his uniform uh, as you know part of the American military, which was pretty common at the time. A lot of soldiers would um, have tin types of themselves made and sometimes sent back to their loved ones um, while they were off in the field. Here you see a tin type studio. 25 cents for six uh, tin types here, right? So you could get six different exposures for for n almost nothing. Then finally, um, well, not quite finally, but in the end, I wanted to, uh, you know, lead with this, the stereograph. And you have the long reading by uh, Holmes on the stereograph. Now, stereograph itself, here's Oliver Wendell. Wendell Holmes daguerreotype of him to give you a sense of what he looked like was developed by uh, a couple of different people. The idea had been around since before photography, uh, believe it or not, um, where you would look at pictures of paintings of things to make them look more three dimensional. Uh, but then it starts to be um, developed further. Sir Charles Wheatstone is the first person to develop it, and then later on, Sir David Brewster, um, you know, pushes a little bit forward. And this is the stereotype that was made by Holmes with the help of uh, William Bates here. And basically, what you're looking at is the stereoscope, which is the way that you look at a, a stereo um, graph photo. Now. One photo goes on each side of this, uh, follow my cursor up here, or a single composite photo, which is usually the case, is placed up here of two images of the same objects that are shot from a camera that has two lenses that are basically the same width of your eye and slightly angled in. And the idea is to mimic the way that the eye sees an object bicamerally from two different, slightly different points of view. So in this one, each one of your eyes will look through one of these viewfinders, but be occluded by this, this little uh, narrow um, piece of material that won't allow you to see the image on the other side uh, of the screen, so that each eye is seeing uh, a photograph in itself. In other words, each one of your eyes sees this picture of a man with big shoes from slightly different angles of view. And then your mind kind of puts those together. And you know, if you've looked at these things, you get a very three-dimensional image. It's part of the trompe l'oeil or fool the eye tradition in art. It's a very hyper-illusionistic painting can do it, but nothing can do it as well at this moment as the stereoscope can do it, and these stereographic images. And they're, they're basically forms of entertainment on the one hand, most of them, but they also start to be used um, as kind of virtual sightseeing adventures. William Henry Jackson, who we'll be dealing with um, in the coming weeks, was a great nature photographer and part of the surveying groups that uh, went off to basically document all of these great um, national um, geographical wonders that were in the United States, produced stereographs in this case of the mud puffs in the lower basin, lower fire, fire hole basin in Yellowstone. You couldn't go there maybe, you know, you didn't have enough money to travel to Yellowstone, but you could buy these stereoscopic uh, images uh, and, and virtually travel there. And it just wasn't the United States. You might want to go to, to Strasbourg, or you might want to, you know, go to, um, you know, see various parts of the world. And you would buy 
lots of these different images of one place or another, all the great sites in the United States or all the great sites in, in, in Europe and kind of virtually travel there. It became a craze. Everyone wanted these. You see this ad for Sears and Roebuck uh, uh, selling a, scare, uh, a stereoscopic view uh, or stereoscopes in their stereoscopic view department here. Or you see, again, you know, once it catches on, you don't have to travel the world, you can travel it virtually, which is something that Wendell uh, Holmes, of course, points out as well. Pont Neuf, you want to go to Paris, don't have the money, just buy a, uh, a bunch of these stereographs. Great Wall of China. And of course, erotica explodes with a stereoscope. Now finally, we'll end with this. It's a pretty interesting phenomenon, uh, carte de visite. Cartes de visite are basically multiple different, um, uh, usually portraits of people that are printed on cheap paper. They're kind of like a, um, what's the best way to put this? They're a little bit like if you were to buy an early, um, um, uh, baseball card or something like that of your favorite baseball player with all of his stats on it and so forth. Um, these were things that were usually pictures of, uh, you know, celebrities of some type or another um, that could be kind of mass produced and widely distributed to people. And they, they caught fire because uh, a man by the name of Andre Adolf Eugène Desdery uh, who was developing this technology with a multi-lens camera. So you could shoot multiple different pictures of various different things on one uh, contact sheet. Uh, got a picture of Napoleon III, who was the leader in France at the time, uh, the second uh, empire uh, leader of France, and reproduce this on paper along like with the vital stats of this man every once in a while it would have quotes from these figures and so forth and napoleon iii loved it uh helped him to uh, you know to make money off of this by publicizing it and then it just kind of caught fire in england john mayle kind of cornered the market for a while uh, when he got these carte de visite, again, just cheap reproductions of, of famous figures of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert who were, um, who had attended the famous um, Crystal Palace exhibition that we'll talk about in the next lecture uh, and loved photography and sat for a portrait had these things uh, created as carte de visite that everyone could go buy because everyone loved these these royals. I don't know why people love the English royals so much, but they still do, right? And um, then anyone could have a picture of your favorite royal couple. And so when Prince Albert died, for instance, Mayle produced this carte de visite known as the death of Prince Albert with various portraits of him and Queen Victoria at various stages of their life. Um, that everyone came to buy. He also got these really weird things. I love this one. This is, uh, you know, the apotheosis of uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. So it's a composite printing of these two major U.S. presidents. Um, apotheosis means kind of being turned into gods here in a carte de visite. And since, I, let's say, most people love George Washington and about half the U.S. population was also uh, quite fond of Lincoln. Uh, after he died, these things explode. Carts de visite could also be, um, as you see in Matthew Brady's kind of compendium here, just famous figures uh, that you might want a picture of with their signatures reproduced down below them, kind of like, again, uh, baseball cards. They could also be, though, used um, as forms of kind of um, ideology. This is a work by J.E. Whitney studio called Cut Nose, who was part of the, the, the Indian Wars and was a notorious kind of bad guy, uh, Native American, uh, who supposedly in 1862 murdered a lot of people. Uh, goodness knows what his reasons or rationale was for this. 
Uh, but if you wanted a picture of, let's say, you know, crime figures, which become all the rage in the ninth, uh, in the twentieth century in the United States, um, you could get those as well. And uh, along with that, one of those great Native American haters, um, George Custer, um, here, uh, you know, you can get that celebrity picture of him. Celebrity pictures of P.T. Barnum. And then if you, if you don't want a whole bunch of carte de visite, you just want, want them all in one place, you can get the 70 celebrated Americans, including all the presidents, carte de visite. Very cheaply, of course, mass produced. If you, uh, you know, want to, again, there was a market for all of these in different parts of the world. If primarily abolitionists and, and black culture wanted pictures of their celebrities, you could get those, Sojourner Truth here. You also got pictures of oddities, um, you know, little people here, Mr. and Mrs. Tom Thumb, the Fredericks. And then, of course, there was this whole cottage industry that you will have read about, so-called spirit photographs. Spirit photographs, uh, you know, this is a, a money-making scheme where you could create a photograph of someone that was overexposed or underexposed and get this kind of ghostly image of them and then composite print it with another figure, oftentimes done in a dark room, oftentimes done without the knowledge of the person who sat for the photograph. They would come into these areas, be kind of their heads filled with all these stories about how their dead relatives were around them in every place. And then a photograph would be taken of them. And a day or two later, you would get that spirit photograph, um, which were also used in carte de visite, both to promote the idea of spiritualism, but also as a kind of um, uh, a parlor trick. This is another example. So just to kind of um, think of us this going forward, the collodion process then develops into the dry plate, which is basically a collodion type process, but without the need for wet, tacky collodion on the glass plate, um, which starts in 1878 and goes all the way into the 19, uh, 1900s. And then you have the development around uh, 1888 or so, all the way up to the present moment of celluloid, of roll film um, that gets higher and higher uh, sensitivity, uses shorter and shorter exposures, and of course is still around with us today. Okay, in our next lecture we will pick up on the ways that photography was promoted and developed as an artistic form.